Hi everyone, and a very warm welcome to this evening's conversation with artist Sky Hapinka and curator Mariana Fernandez, which is part of MPAC's series on decolonizing language. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that at MPAC, we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present, and we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. I'm Vic Brooks, I'm senior curator of time-based visual art here at MPAC, which is on the campus of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm a white woman with red shoulder length hair, I'm wearing a gray shirt, and I have on dark rimmed glasses. I would like to begin today's program with a special thanks to Heather Briegel, who's the Director of Cultural Affairs at the Stockbridge Muncie Community. Um, her conversation with Dr. Leila Hua Lanzalotti in February kicked off this series of talks and really foregrounded the importance of our engagement with indigenous ancestral knowledge and linguistic practices in order to counteract the systemic erasure of indigenous culture. So just a few words of introduction before I hand it over to our guests. We are thrilled to be joined today by artist and filmmaker Sky Hapinka, who is a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin and the Pechanga Band of Luiseño Indians. Sky's photo, video and text works center around personal positions of indigenous homeland and landscape. And just this last year, uh, last year he moved um, to the Hudson Valley where he teaches in the film department at Bard College and his incredible exhibition, which was called Centers of Somewhere was recently presented at the Hessel Museum there and curated by Lauren Cornell. This conversation is moderated today by writer and curator Mariana Fernandez, who's a curatorial fellow with us at MPAC. And she's working on a new commission with artist Clarissa Tosin with me while she finishes her graduate studies in the history of art at Williams College. So without further ado, many thanks for joining us today and I'll hand over to Mariana, who's gonna just dive straight into introducing Sky's work. Many thanks for coming. So Sky's videos, photographs and text-based works are animated by an exploration of language as a container of culture and as a way to formulate questions of identity and belonging. His filmmaking career began around the same time that he started learning Chinookwawa, an, an almost extinct Creole trade language spoken in the Pacific Northwest, and Ho-Chunk, the endangered indigenous language of the Ho-Chunk people. His works are deeply subjective meditations on indigenous homeland and landscape, and often overlay English, Chinookwawa, and Ho-Chunk to move beyond static ideas about language and cultural identity. Language in Sky's work is a narrative device as much as a material, a conceptual framework, and a methodology. As the third in impact series of decolonizing language conversations seeking to destabilize linguistic hierarchies and present strategies of indigenous language revitalization, Sky will discuss his use of language in crafting alternative understandings of place, community, and knowledge transmission. Um, yeah, so as I said when I emailed you the questions, I, I struggled with finding a beginning for this conversation, mostly because, first of all, I feel like all you've been asked all the questions. <laughs> you've spoken so profusely um, in interviews about the things that I um, have been wanting to ask you, but also because your work is so much about weaving different temporalities together and offering different modes of moving through space that are less about a beginning, a middle or an end or a linear trajectory. And a passage I kept coming back to from Perfidia, your book of poetry, and from your recent short film, Lore, is we can be close, we can share, but not without permission, not without gift, and not without compassion. So I wanted to begin by, by bringing up how in other interviews you've talked at length about keeping certain stories private, about the care that you put into being deliberate about what is shown and what isn't shown on screen. And um, in more specifically, as you are piling all these film strips atop each other, I think the work really resists the easy consumption of information that art often entitles. Um, but you also seem to be offering a different proposition that possibilities for engagement for non-native audiences might exist outside of intrusion. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you negotiate the collaging of information in your work, by which I mean information overload with the absence often of context or explanation of what isn't shown. I mean, like, um, thank you. Thank you for the, the thoughtful question um, and, and for looking at that passage. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of things around that film that I was very uncertain about going into it um, with the texts, with the length, 
with what I was filming, with the song. I mean, it, it felt like a very, um, very much a departure of the things that I had been doing or um, have been working through um, in a lot of ways. And I think that, that, that passage really highlights a, lo a lot of those things around what the, the, the conceit of the film is or what the thesis is of it. I mean, having to do with friendship and having to do with closeness and having to do with relationships, um, whether they're more abstracted through a colonial lens or more immediate through the, um, through the, the, the proximity of friendship. Um, and that's like how I do, how I do feel guided by um, certain aspects of, of what I make available or accessible to an audience, um, what they can get or what they can't get. I mean, there's some things that I have no idea about, like whether or not they'll pick up on the the, the, the coded language or the references or the context or the subtext. Um, but my hope is that even if I don't explicitly state what it is I am talking about or what it is I'm pointing to, that the um, implication then is that there is something there <laughs> that is worthy of, of investigation or questioning or feeling or acknowledgement of, of, of the space that it takes up in your head or your heart. and. That's, I don't know, like, I mean, if anything, like, I mean, I do make the work for myself or, like, my friends or my family or my community, and, like, that is definitely what guides how I then, I don't know, how, 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 how then deeply coded it is or not. But then also, too, like, I'm not necessarily concerned with the coding or the encoding of, of um, the topics or the reference or the, the, the cultural context. It's more about having... Um, I don't know, like, like a conversation and being okay with people um, listen in, you know? It's like, who are you talking to and how are you talking? What register are you in? And, you know, what's what shorthand do you use? And if an audience can pick up on that, then that's great. If not, then that's great too, you know? Um, I, 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 th I think that as direct and specific as I tend to be or as I want to be, that also is a way of opening up um, the space for others to participate or to be present in. Um, just as much as if I was like, you know, had a thousand footnotes and was explaining everything that I was doing or saying. Um, I think it's just like, it's, it's those, those moments of trying to understand through or despite of, in spite of um, uh, the need to be an interpreter or the need to be a guide. Um, I'd rather not be either of those. Yeah. This film fe feels also more subjective maybe than your other films, just um, like when you're when you're talking about being in an empty apartment or after killing a spider, like I really like those moments and it feels like it's as much for you to formulate these questions as, yeah, it, it just feels like it's you navigating these questions rather than making them for anyone in specific. Yeah, and then Perfidia too, I, I was just like, I kept going back and forth between the two and I was really like interested in how you know, certain turns of phrases were slightly adjusted and then others were like recycled. And I think that's something that's really cool about your whole practice, just like um, maybe not like using something and then like leaving it finished, done, but you like keep finding ways to like uh, make it productive and generative. And that's something that I, I don't know, the balance between like the text-based work of Perfidia and how it translates into lore was really interesting for me. I killed a spider last night and I apologized in earnest. My grandma was a spider, and her kid are mine. Easy steps around a post on apartment, nothing to do and nowhere to be, other than in the tranquility of an in-between emotionally equidistant from what was and what could have been. Like sunrise and dusk, the light is better here, but only for a time. No, I mean, like, I, that's... Um... I think like getting more comfortable with like having this piece of writing, this text that became Perfidia and then applying it to different projects, like whether it's Cloudless Blue Eagles of Summer or to Lore or to the photo series The Land Describes Itself. Um, I th there was just something about, you know, like having this text be a place that I guess like, I got mind ideas from or um, I think I described it the other day as just being like, you know, a free idea. Um, uh, a, a way to then think about how things that I've done can be then recycled or can be used or can be applied in different ways and not necessarily like Easter eggs or anything but just like how then you know if, if someone recognizes a phrase in Cloudless Blue Eagles of Summer in the same way that they see lore or through reading Perfidia or through looking at the photo series then that just like I don't know it sparks a connection it sparks like 
you know, it's, it's, it's the creation of subtext, it's the creation of context that, you know, then is inviting a viewer, a reader, a, a listener into the conversation that I'm having with these works, um, and then creating a language or vernacular around that. So, um, yeah, I, I've become more comfortable with that in recent years. And I mean, I think it's something that I want to continue exploring further, just the way that I can make a web of different ideas and thoughts and concepts through these different mediums and um, seeing how they can then be generative or like greater than the whole. Yeah, that's really interesting that you that you said that because I definitely think that there's like moments of recognition in certain of your works and then you kind of like push back against that too with characters that we don't know or like um, introducing new names that you don't necessarily introduce. Um, so it's like, yeah, again, like a, a balance maybe between uh, giving you like all of this information and then not explaining all of it necessarily. Yeah, I mean, even just like, I mean, like Lilu and Talapus, like, I mean, uh, yeah, I offer no explanation about who those people are, but I, I don't know. It's, it's always endearing to like see someone like do that extra work and like, you know, um, I don't know, like figure out like, oh, it's, this is Lilu, um, <laughs> this is Wolf and Coyote from Chernikin origin story myths or just like Chernikin myths. And so like there's a connection there or just like an invitation to then look further into the works. Um, that is neither, I don't know, intrusive or, I don't know, insistent, but it's there. Yeah. Okay, something I found really interesting about Here You Are Before the Trees, your uh, recent work was when you sent it to me, uh, I think it was like three, four months ago, you didn't have, um, you, yeah, you didn't explain like who was speaking or where these materials were pulled from. And I spent hours just like transcribing, um, yeah, just like trying to figure out, you know, like, piecing together where these, these these different pieces come from. And then you added like, this is Vine Deloria Jr. or um, yeah, the different speakers. I'm wondering like what led you to maybe give that extra level of, of interpretation. Um, I've, I feel like there were, actually I, I talked to Renya um, who also appears in the video and I mean, she was asking me about someone, and I don't know. It just it just felt like the um, what's the word? Obtusiveness was getting in the way of the project in some ways. Like you know, I mean, I I, I didn't want to be obtuse for the sake of it or opaque for the sake of it. Um, like what was it actually serving? And rather, it was also playing with I guess like semiotics or like naming things and signifying things. Like I mean, as the title comes from Bart's essay you know in terms of like mythology and just this idea of like here you are before the sea it's true it bears no meaning you know like it's the one thing without signification and so then like how then can i like play with that a bit and you know look at signification around like this is Vine lawyer jr this is renya ramirez this is my grandmother this is you know the mozija like these are the places but are they really these places and so like even just like like naming what these different channels were i mean it just it felt like it was it was, it was allowing the viewer more into the space that I was thinking of um, without making them do too much work in trying to figure it out because that's like not the work that I wanted a viewer to be doing is to figure out where these places are. I wanted that to be like um, the starting point. And so it just like, it just made sense to like <laughs> give the, the viewer um, a little bit more of a helping hand in um, deciphering what some of these codes are and like what some of these places and, and people speaking who they are um, in order to, I guess, like get at the actual thing that I want to be talking about. And so, I mean, I, I guess I think about that with the view, the videos too. It's just like, you know, it, what ways can I get over myself or like get beyond like my need for um, just like um, creating a sense of obfuscation or, or directness to an audience. And then what are ways that I can also like help an audience like get there as well, or just like look at the things that I want them to be looking at or hope that they pay attention to. And yeah, I think like the, the version I sent you didn't have any of that sort of text. And then, um, yeah, I, I think I added like a descriptor for each channel as it began, um, a descriptor for each of the speakers as they were speaking. And yeah, I think a little bit more contextual information that then I guess like pointed to the temporality of the piece, you know, where you have John Quinney speaking in the 1800s, you have Vine Deloria in the 1970s, you have Renier Ramirez in like the 20, um, 2010s. Um, my grandmother, you know, in a different, uh, around the same time. Um, so then it became just about like, um, not necessarily like a, a commingling of these different aspects and these different 
voices, but rather like demarcating where they exist in time and then seeing how they can actually exist um, simultaneously or together in conversation. Yeah, I think you added to the text of this is the Wasilla, this is the Mahitan you took. Um, and you, I, I mean, if I'm not wrong, those like switch and invert. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, like naming doesn't fix these things in a static in a static place either. Yeah, I mean, I think just like even just like the, the premise of like, you know, on the right channel, you have Wisconsin with the Wazija and the left channel, you have the Mahikana, it's like you have the like Hudson River Valley and the center one is the road, it's a connecting one. Like, I mean, that provided enough of a framework, I think, for then, yeah, the viewer to like get an insight into what I'm thinking through and to see like the ways in which um, it either changes or um, bounces back and forth or the naming or the signification becomes something that isn't necessarily bound or tied to the rules of the channel or the rules of the installation um, then becomes something else. Yeah. So going off of this point about not knowing, um, I wanted to bring up this, this point in your introductory essay to Perfidia by, by Julie Niemi where she talks about this, you teaching her um, certain words in Chinookwawa and there's a gesture for not knowing where you like extend your hands out I think that was really beautiful to me I think it really like reduces the stigma of a lot of systems of learning and specifically learning languages and yeah I I wanted to ask about your own experience learning languages and how if this has affected your methodology of maybe approaching things in a less static way more ongoing like embracing this not knowing it no I mean I actually I've, I've, I've just been thinking about that the last few days um, especially with thinking about how I am teaching film um, and one of the things that like my uh, language teacher told me when I first started um, and as he was teaching me how to like teach this method is that you teach the way that you're taught and that's like how people fall back on to you know imparting information or knowledge or teaching someone so think about like you know like how was I taught this thing like that's how I'm going to teach someone else as I teach it but then like I mean if you look even deeper into that like think how loaded that is in terms of like intergenerational trauma and these systems of oppression or how we then replicate those in terms of like our children or the people that we teach like thinking about these different systems um, and how they exist like that's where I feel I'm most I don't know, trying to look at my language teaching and my language learning and how it can be applied to many different things, whether it's me teaching film or me making films and thinking about what I want to share with an audience. Um, like, yeah, like, you know, what Julie was talking about in the essay is like, no thinking, no suffering. Or no, she was talking about pull me through it, you know, just like, it's like, pull me through it, you know, it's like, if you don't know something, just like, give me the signal and then I know when to help you. And like, there's another one too, which is like, no thinking, no suffering, where, you know, Evan, you know, he was like, as soon as you see your, your student start to like furrow the brow and like, you know, go like this, like they're thinking, they're thinking too hard about what they're trying to do and just like give them the answer. Like let them know, like it's a signal that they need help and so help them, like don't make them suffer. And it's like, that's a huge thing too, because I feel like, I mean, even with like with film work or even just like the things that I'm talking about, I feel like I, I suffered a lot in order to get to where I am, but I don't want my audience to suffer in the same way and I don't want my students to suffer in the same ways that I have. And so how can I make this easier for them? Which also is another part of Evan's like, um, the way your keys thing is just like, um, look how easy you made this. Um, uh, there's this idea too, like where, I mean, it took him like 10 years to learn Chinook, you know, and it took me uh, two years and it took my students less time. And there's a certain, there's something that can happen with that too, where it's like, you know, it took me so long. How are you learning it so fast? You know, I feel like, you know, you should like pay your dues and like learn it as long as I did or whatever. Or there's a certain sort of like hubris that comes with like with with that sort of like dynamic. And I remember feeling that when I was teaching someone and like they were learning like way faster than I did. And I felt like, oh, God, am I dumb? You know, like, I mean, I like what, what what's going on here? And, you know, I was talking to Evan and we we're talking about that and it, that and he was just like, you know, it's like, you know, this is the design of it. Like, we want to make things faster. We want to make our students better students than we were. And, like, that's a sign of success. And, like, that's a sign of, like, you know, accomplishment. And not to feed your ego entirely, but it's just like, you know, like, you went through it in a certain sort of way. And we talked a lot about, like, pedagogy. And then we applied it. And so, like, that's a success. And so it's just, like, look how easy you made it. Look how easy I made it. Look how easy they're going to make it. And to just, like, I don't know, try and enjoy successes in a different way rather than focusing on the I and the me and thinking about how it's a holistic or community, communal part of understanding or creating a language or creating um, a way of teaching and um, imparting information. 
And I do think a lot about that with like the film work and what that's doing. Where again, like even if like, you know, I'm speaking on a register that is very specific to my community, it doesn't mean that an audience isn't, um, actually that really relates to another sort of technique. Um, there's, this, there's this other technique called co-talker where like if you're a speaker that's, you know, at like a novice or intermediate level and you're in a room with like fluent speakers and there's like two sp fluent speakers and they're speaking at a superior level, you know, they're just like going back and forth and you don't know what they're talking about um, because you're just still down here. Like what you do is like you listen to them and you just focus on their intonation. You focus on the song of the language and you try and like, you know, replicate that. Like if you put your hand here and your hand there, you can hear your, you can hear your voice. And yeah. so then you can then hear yourself as you're imitating their intonation and their song of the language. And so that becomes something that um, is about engaging with the speakers without necessarily being in a conversation. And I think that also serves as a metaphor for what I think some of the work that I tend to do is, or the, the, the lexicons that I tend to work in around different indigenous communities or different topics that I'm interested in. If an audience isn't necessarily interested or available to like um, uh, uh, be a part of that community, but they're also like willing to engage with them in some sort of way, there's a certain sort of aspect of just like seeing what is being said or like focusing on different aspects that they can relate to, even if it isn't like the actual gist or kernel of it. That really comes across in Wawa. I think if there's any film that's like about language explicitly, it's that one. Um, and yeah, could you talk about how, so you started learning Chinook Wawa in Portland, right, with Evan. Um, Wilson Bob taught Henry Zeng and Henry Zeng taught Evan, your teacher. So there's like all of these levels of lineage that are also collapsed into language um, that are, yeah, maybe that also like exceeds the way that you can represent it in film. I think you like mind that and being like, these are subtitles that don't necessarily translate perfectly into English. There are always like gaps in knowledge, like excessive knowledge. and that's like, I don't know, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, like with that piece, and I mean, I think that being like really, I think like my first like quote unquote experimental film, um, it was one where I think I was just like, you know, trying to see what felt good or what worked or what was expressive in terms of how I was feeling and um, like, and thinking about those anxieties of learning a second language, but also the anxieties of learning a second language that is also endangered. Um, that also like has a huge community behind it and that also like you know where the, the the history of that community is one that you're supposed to know and you're supposed to learn and you're supposed to be aware of and um, it's just like it's it's not a burden but it's just like there's there's weight and like there's a, there's a weight to that and how do you express that and how do you acknowledge that or how do you move through these different um, spaces that um, both exist in the past and also the present and also how present is the past and language really activates those questions in a lot of ways and the uncertainty of translation and the uncertainty of a lot of words um, is also like I mean it's, it's a stumbling block for students early on you know and it's like one I encountered as a student of the language and then it's also one that I saw with my students as I was teaching them and so like I mean I knew that you know, the, the, the word for like and want is the same. And that throws a lot of students off because it doesn't align up with English American sort of values in terms of politeness, you know. You can't say I want this, you know, that's rude. And like, it's not rude, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's how this language functions. And so take the language on its own terms and don't impose Western American values on this language. Um, because that'll shift the language in ways that, you know, you may not be ready for or that may not be fair to the language. Um, but also language shift can happen and should happen, but, you know, it's just like, how can you mitigate that or be intentional around that? And I think the film, like, does a lot of those different things in terms of, like, my questions around what language is doing, how I fit into it, how my teacher fits into it, and how history is compressed or can be compressed in such a way. Yeah. I mean, in my own, like, very limited engagement with Indigenous languages, I was doing this translation from Kiche, which is a Mayan dialect into English subtitles. And like when I was working with the Kiche speakers, they were like, I was like, how do I say this word? Or like, what does, you know, like asking for explanation. And obviously there was no English equivalent. And it's like, how do you make that line up neatly into subtitles? Like, like, so I don't know, it's like way more productive to have like maybe like 10 words and 
for the speaker to be like, okay, I will never get the full meaning. And that's like, fine. It's like somewhere in here. Yeah, it definitely does visualizations. Visualizations help. I mean, I don't know, like conceptualize the idea of like, you know, things not lining up perfectly or there being room for translation or interpretation. Um, and your point also brought up the, the, the question of how with language revitalization, um, just like how quickly new generations are learning the language that just means that it's like bound to shift and that's like so productive but I don't know if there's still this like belief that if a if an indigenous language doesn't stay the same as it was you know hundreds of years ago it's maybe like inauthentic or like this like desire to keep the things as they were um like hundreds of years ago have you encountered that at all um yeah I have I mean I think that's like where a lot of those ideas come from I mean and consternation as well. Like, I mean, being in conversations with people and, you know, like having this really strong idea that like the language needs to be authentic, you know, the ways, the way that, you know, um, the way that it was spoken a hundred years ago. And like we have like, maybe, maybe we have tapes like from the 1930s of speakers and we should like replicate that and we should mimic it. And I'm all for that, you know, like it was the best we can. But I also think that there should be some moments of grace or just like, you know, uh, a space for, the fact that I may say things with an English inflection as I'm asking the question, you know, like I may say things incorrectly. I may like, you know, conjugate verbs in a way that might not have existed or there might not be doc documentation of. Um, and so I don't know. I, I, it's it's it. It's like there's no way to not inform um, uh, the in the United States or Canada too, to some degree, um, the influence of English on these languages now as they're being revitalized. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's, I'd rather not operate from a deficit or from this place of like, you know, there's this unattainable idea of purity that we'll never achieve. Because like, that's very unhealthy. And I think it like, it, it teaches people to feel shame in where they're at and um, their inability to be quote unquote authentic. Um, that I am wholeheartedly against. And I think that it's just like, it takes conversations and it takes like efforts to like, you know, speak the way that our elders spoke and speak the way that our, 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 our ancestors did, but also just to allow a space for a bit more compassion around how that's often unattainable or imperfect. Yeah, I think that really comes across in anti-objects in these like moments where Wilson Bob and Henry Zeng are like one of them is sleepy or like one one of them is like teasing the other just like the like they know like every day in between moments of language that really get at like the utility of language rather than like trying to preserve like maybe notions that just aren't as useful now as they were you know hundreds of years ago yeah yeah definitely I mean like those I don't know like those moments are the ones that I think were really beautiful or just really touching I mean yeah, like, I mean, just spending years, like, you know, like talking to Henry and spending time with Henry and, you know, him talking about Wilson and then like reading like the transcripts of their conversations. And when, when Henry finally shared with me those tapes, those recordings of that archive, you know, just like it, it opened up that archive that I've been engaging with into, I don't know, new ways that felt a lot more human or that felt a lot more immediate, you know, and... I don't know, just like, I mean, there's actually a, a, a piece too, like where Henry, like it's, I don't know if like Henry meant to, but like there's like a four second clip of like him playing guitar, you know? And I decided not to put that in the film, um, but it's just like another moment of just like, you know, the errata that appears like through these archives that also like give more shape and understanding to just the situation. So just like, I don't know, those moments that um, are often touching and that are often inviting in, 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 in ways that I think are really beautiful. Can you connect, how do you connect that in anti-objects to your own navigation of these uh, landscapes? Um, like, as anti-objects was, it was a commission. And so I had the sort of the conceit of the project in mind before going into it. Like, I knew I wanted to film the bridge. Um, I knew I wanted to film the plank house. And I happened to be going to the reservation for a conference. So I knew I would film there. Um, so I had in mind like all these different places that I was going to be in and I wasn't quite sure how to film them. And even I remember being at the plank house and like walking across the bridge to get there. And um, there's this little footbridge that goes over some train tracks. And I was thinking like, what am I going to shoot? I have no idea. Um, but then I just started shooting and um, 
I knew that I didn't want to shoot inside the plank house. Um, and so like that was something that I then, you know, worked backwards from in terms of like building out the space or just like building out these certain abstractions. And same thing with the bridge, you know, like I knew I wanted to walk across it. Um, I didn't really plan out how well that was gonna <laughs> look with um, some, uh, uh, with handheld movements. And that's also like why there's a lot of cuts back and forth because I didn't, I, it felt it was too jostly or too handheld. So then I just thought like, you know, I can cut back and lean into that and cut back and forth between these different moments where I'm also walking. And um, even just like different times of the day too, like where my friend Sweetwater, um, you know, like we were hanging out and I wanted to go shoot the bridge. And so like she happened to be there. And then so I was just like, okay, yeah, that's like a native person on this bridge named for Tilica, named for these people. And like there's a connection there. There's something there that then lines it up with um, being in the space of the plank house and not being present or just like not being inside of it, being around it and being on the reservation like where like I'm moving through the space, but then you turn around and you see Greg Archuleta there, you know, who is my guide and who is my friend and who is the person that was showing me this place. Um, so yeah, and I think just like, you know, weaving in and out of these different ideas of place, these different ideas of artifacts, and also like looking at presence and how, I don't know, like the camera movements as they move through space also function as anti-objects or just ways that then replicate like what an anti-object sort of architectural space can be and how then the camera becomes a document of my wandering through these different spaces rather than um, a guide of saying like how you should move through these spaces you know it becomes a lot more reflexive i think in ways that hopefully opens it up to to them thinking about these different spaces from a subjective lens and sweetwater's in your uh recent feature film right not me mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i haven't seen that film but i read about how part of it was you testing out the camera and that ended up going into the film. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's, that's like, again, going back to this like organic idea of like experiencing space and like trying things out and maybe that makes it into the final film, maybe it doesn't, but it's more, it feels way more organic and like an organic relationship to archives rather than like, I'm here to like extract this information and like paint this like authoritative, like uh, view of, of like trying to teach you something or whatever yeah i mean that i mean i often like say or like think about like how i just tend to work with people that i know or people that i am friends with or trust um i don't know i think that that makes me more comfortable um uh in terms of like how i move through the space with the camera i mean I don't know, just like, I mean, I remember like working with people or just like, you know, working in a sort of like cruise type of atmosphere and I don't know, like someone's always questioning what I'm shooting, <laughs> you know, it's like, should you be filming that right now? Do you want to get that shot? And I just like hate that question. And I just like hate that sort of like, a, uh, I don't know, insertion into like what I'm doing. I mean, because like, I don't like shooting a lot, you know, and like I like being very deliberate about when I do shoot and especially like native people, you know, because like I am constantly negotiating like what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I mean, always like erring on the side of, you know, appropriate in terms of like, being in these places with a camera. Like that's something that I feel like I've grown up with. Um, just like, like being, you know, at Palos and like someone will always like stop you, usually a white person to say, can I take a picture? If you're like in your outfit, your dance outfit. And you know, it's just something that you grow up with. And you're like, you can like be like, yeah, you can be like, no, but like, those sorts of rules of photography are always encouraged at a powwow. Like the MC um, will announce, like you know, don't take photos without permission, you know. And it's just it's it's something that I think I was like taught at an early age, and I think a lot of powwow people are taught as just you know how to engage with you know the audience, the spectators that are there to watch you, in ways that gives you agency and control over how your image is captured. Um, and so those are the things that I, I I do think about as I'm. You know, filming with friends or with Sweetwater, like in this film, and, and Antiochus too, like where it's often by chance, but it's also um, around comfort and trust. Yeah, yeah. This point about like ethnography and like um, just like you know, native representations on film have traditionally been so exploitative. And you use this point about like um, ethnopoetic film language. I do you still think about your work in that way, or have you sort of like moved away from that? I mean, I think I've moved away from it a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't even know where I stand with it right now. Because <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've, I've talked about moving away from it, but then also, um, 
I don't know. It's still a big part of like these films um, and the history and just like my experience making them. Um, I do I do want to think less about indigenous work through the lens of ethnography and without the ethno in front of that serving as a prefix that then dictates like, you know, is every work that is indigenous then viewed through the lens of the ethno, whether it's ethnopoetic or um, experimental or ethnographic experimental film or whatever. Um, and kind of like how to like be free from that and just like make it its own thing. Um, I mean, I feel like I, it's it's like I talk about these things more than I'm actually concerned with them while making something, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's like I do like think about it and I do wonder and um, I think like in ways that you know isn't flippance or isn't irreverence. I guess irreverent to a point, but um, uh, I don't I don't know. I don't want to like think about it too much. Um, I think because I'm making a film right now. I think that's like why. Like, um, <laughs> often as I'm making something, you know, I think about like these different sort of concerns of the film itself that are immediate. And then, like, once the film is done, then I have a better understanding of like what the film is and like what I was thinking about. And with the short film that I'm working on right now, I, it's my first one in like a year and a half, I think. Um, after. And between that time, I think Lore in 2019 is my last short film, but then I've also like made the feature and then also the three channel installation. Um, but it's it's interesting to look, look back at like making a short film now after having spent so much time away from the form and then, I don't know, like trying to get back into the swing of things, but then also like, you know, just like wanting to make a short film that, you know, deals with abstraction and deals with language um, because I've been away from it so long, I feel like. Um, so it may serve to to help think about it but i think once i have uh, a rough edit done or even i guess like a final cut done um i can start thinking about those questions a little bit more critically but i think like with everything you know there's a waxing and waning of interests that i think is only human how do you see your work as fitting within this like trajectory of experimental film like is that a label that you are more comfortable less comfortable with or even like just in terms of like process and how that label opens up more space potentially to do more stuff with like abstraction. No, I mean I think I'm I'm really open to it. Um, I mean it's 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 a word, it's a label with a lot of baggage, um, some positive, some negative, but I think it's a starting point. And like again, to look at language, you know, it's just like how do you start? You know, like you begin like by scaffolding, and then like then you can like build out a, a further complicated understanding and relationship to it. And to someone that may have never really engaged with experimental film before, just saying this is experimental is a starting point. It's a way to begin a conversation. And like they don't care about like all of my you know intellectual concerns around you know experimental cinema and the history of the avant garde or whatever or a centralized form and. You know, it's like they shouldn't care, you know, but like how can then that be an entry point into understanding this, which was also like part of like my entry into this too. It's just like everything that isn't like documentary or narrative is experimental, you know, then like that's where you start. It may not be where you start, but it's like where I started. And like then what are the next questions? What are the next steps in terms of like being invested in this form, in this genre, um, in ways that make you a contributor as well as a questioner and like a participant in it and active in it? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of things I can say about that. Um, but I, I, I do I do fly the flag of the experimental filmmaker, I think. I keep thinking about the ways that you, like, um, like use certain elements of experimental film with, I don't know if you've read Jose Esteban Muñoz has this whole thing about disidentifying. Um, so it's kind of like, um, yeah, like maybe Hollis Frampton's nostalgia offers like some useful things, some maybe like the nostalgic element of it is not so useful. So you're like kind of like recycling and piecing things together to form something new. And I was thinking about this in relation to your wall calligrams and kind of like maybe taking this anthropological text that is like not completely useful to me and forming it into something that like leads to something else. Um, yeah, I was wondering if we could talk about your wall calligrams for a bit. Yeah, I mean, um, those really began with uh, this uh, film uh, called I'll Remember You As You Were, Not As What You'll Become, um, where they open the film and they close the film, like those calligrams. Um, and I don't even know what I was doing. Oh yeah, I think I was like, I, I, I found these texts, but I was really conflicted about how to include them. I mean, like they were in this book that was about Ho-Chunk 
ceremonies around reincarnation and I read the introduction and I didn't want to finish it. I didn't want to read it because it just felt like this knowledge isn't for me, you know? Like, um, there's uh, barriers between, like, myself and, like, you know, clan stuff in the tribe and community stuff in the tribe that anthropologists, like, totally went around and superseded and just, like, got an informant to tell them everything. And so it felt like I, this isn't my place to read this, and so I didn't. I just read the introduction or, like, I think the first chapter before they got into the ceremonies. And... The texts in it are, are are from that introduction, and as I was conflicted about looking at that text, I, I what was I thinking about? Oh yeah, I was like thinking about calligrams actually. I go, I was reading Big Sur and the Oranges of Hieronymus Bosch, like this um Henry Miller book, and um he was talking about Apollinaire, and like that led me to research Apollinaire, and um think about calligrams as a way of looking at texts, and that seemed a lot more exciting than concrete poetry. And uh, I just started to engage with them a bit more. And that gave me the idea to then look at um, uh, um, these, these texts and move them in a different way. And like immediately like, what came to mind were the effigy mounds because I don't know what led them, the, the text to those shapes, but it just, it just seemed to make sense. And um, then it became about, you know, just like reclaiming the effigy mounds as well because they're often denied um, Ho-Chunk provenance. Um, and have been for like a hundred years. I think that there's more of a movement to acknowledge Ho Chunk as the ancestors and the caretakers of the effigy mounds. But for a good hundred years, you know, like we were viewed as too primitive to have made them, and that the mound builders, you know, were some great society that you know we ran out and that isn't here anymore. You know, um, and which is like it's it's very it's a, it's, a, it's a very violent history to then participate in you know to think about it and like when how one views oneself and how one views, is viewed in the community you know like it's an excuse for white people to revere like indigenous history but then also to dislocate and remove indigenous presence from that history as well or from that conversation it's like it's it's again it goes into that idea of purity it's like oh look how great your ancestors were why are you such trash which i mean is as far more literal than i i, I wish that it was um and so just like, you know, putting the, these texts in the shape of effigy mounds is a way to counter that or to reclaim them in some sort of way or to acknowledge connection and kinship to these effigy mounds. Um, and it's a practice that continued, like, you know, through the, um, after the film into uh, this, this book um, around the edge of Encircling Lake, where I think there were like three or four more, or four more um, calligrams within that. And I don't know, I just like, I really enjoyed doing them. Um, it was a way to like think about texts that are historical, that are quotes, and that um, I don't know, just like resonate with me in some sort of way. And it's 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 a way to then think about them through a different shape and to give shape to these different effigy mounds, which may or may not exist anymore. Yeah, even the concept of like informants and linguistic informants. I mean, it's just so extractive and so like essentialized. I think. Um, a way that I was connecting all of this in your work was through Renya Ramirez's concept of the hub and offering a way of like, um, yeah, for, for Native people to connect beyond static ideas about place and, and uh, land and think more about like storytelling, emailing, phone calling. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, like maybe if language too functions in a way um, of crafting a hub and creating these like, uh, systems of like lineage and kinship that go beyond, you know, land. Not to say obviously, not not to take away from the importance of decolonization, but just to say that um, there are more expansive ways to think about belonging and kinship. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, th I think about that. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I think that that's in some ways like where this short film Dislocation Blues comes from or just like highlighted or emphasized through is just like, going back and forth between like Milwaukee, where I was living at the time and Standing Rock, which is like 10 hours away, um, <clears throat> which I like really emphasized the feeling that I had too, is just like how good it feels to be around native people, you know? Like usually at powwows or usually at gatherings or, or, or feasts or wherever. And just like how there's a certain weight that then is released when I'm around native people that I don't realize or attention that I don't realize I'm carrying and you know it goes into language it goes into like you know i mean whatever sort of slang you're using or whatever intonation you're using or whatever accent you're using and i don't know i think about that too like especially like you know like talking a lot you know with q and a's and stuff and trying to sound smart and trying to sound like i know what i'm talking about and then 
Um, just thinking about like, I don't know, how do I talk around my mom? You know, how do I talk around my brother or sister? And it's just like a certain ease or it's just a certain sort of like freedom that comes with that. I mean, you know, it's akin to code switching, it's akin to like, you know, just changing register around different contexts. But I don't know, I think like language plays an important part of that in understanding community and like giving a shape to community and like thinking about the language that you use when around you people that you identify with in a different way. I mean, even me forcing you to be like, uh, where, like, where do you situate your work? Like, I, I realize that's not totally productive. And I mean, it's very, if anything is clear, it's that it comes from a very like deeply subjective organic place about this is what I'm thinking now. This is what I'm going to do. Um, if you like it, you like it. If you did, like, I'm not necessarily trying to, you know, teach anything. No, I, mean, like, I, I, I don't think you're doing that. And I, I think that there's a time and place for everything, you know, like, I mean, there is no static sort of spectrum where we all lie and we all exist, you know? I mean, and someone's like, I mean, like, I want to be here. I want to be talking about the work. I want to be making the work, I you know? I mean, I wish I, I was, I wish that we were in an auditorium right now with like people, you know? But like, um, it's, it's, it's like, how do these different ideas and how these different parts of ourselves exist in these different contexts? And, but I think the question is like, how do we have control over that? How do we have agency over those different spaces that we exist in? You know, like, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, doing a QA and a with my family, you know? I mean, I don't also don't want to be, you know, sharing the same sort of intimacies that I have with my family with, you know, which are strangers, you know? So it just, I, I think it's that some sort of like um, temporal spectrum and also just like the locational one and also like the, um, the, the, the personal one around who we're with and, you know, um, how, how we're communicating. Um, I also wanted to ask you, maybe, yeah, maybe to conclude, but I, I know we're running out of time, but in here you are before the trees, all of these different levels of archives. I'm wondering how you, yeah, just like how you approach them. Um, I mean, there's poems, there's uh, Renya Ramirez's like recent like uh, theorization around the hub, Vine Deloria Jr. is just like weaving together these different temporalities. And if that also comes from like a, a very like organic place or yeah I don't know if that like I guess I'm trying to ask how if there was a starting point or if it was just like this text is speaking to me this one is speaking to me um I think like yeah for the commission I I had to put together a proposal and um I think like there was like some things that stood out immediately I guess like very akin to like you know anti-objects where you know, I mean, like having conversations with Lauren Cornell about, you know, the history of Bard College and um, uh, learning that Vine Deloria Jr.'s father went to the first incarnation of Bard in the 1920s. And then also just like, you know, learning like the Stockbridge Muncier from here and like they're, you know, they got relocated to Wisconsin. And I remember like going to, you know, play bingo at the Stockbridge casino with my grandmother you know and um it's just like those sort of connections like started to reveal themselves and um i actually was interested in this um i forget what his name is not it's not henry real cloud is it henry real cloud um but uh this uh this ho-chunk person that was involved in drafting the miriam report which really like paved the way for, um, I think, a lot of, like, I mean, complicated reform around uh, governmental policy around Native people in the country in the 1920s. Um, and not quite, like, finding, like, a line but to include this person in the film. But then I think through research, I found, like, oh, wait, his, his granddaughter is Renya. And I was like, holy shit, you know, like, I, I did this interview with Renya, like, two years ago, you know? And I thought that I had lost the recording and... It turns out that I didn't, um, and so listening to the recording and just like thinking, like hearing what she was talking about with the hub, it just really like connected a lot of the, a lot of these different points, and you know listening to this like um, lecture that Vine Deloria Jr. gave um, in Amherst, you know which is like you know approximately close to the Hudson River Valley, but then also just like complicated enough to like think about New England and just these histories that I I felt like you know was really trying to look at through the landscape as well as through the connections between the hub through um, the Slackbridge Muncie through me being Ho-Chunk in this land now and um, through these bigger conversations around what it means to be present what it means to be in the landscape and like where you know the sort of like semiotics of that fit in as as the the, the title suggests 
Yeah, and again, all these different levels of lineage that maybe aren't explicitly said in the film, but they're there and they are important and they like shape the way that knowledge is produced ultimately. Yeah, I think that's the questions I have. Is there a work that you wanted to discuss more? No, no, I think, yeah, I really appreciate the questions and the opportunity to go deeper into some of these things that I think have been around my brain, you know? So thank you. <laughs>